Hey, welcome back to another edition of Democrats Live. This is Congressman Keith Ellison. I'm your deputy chair of the DNC. And today we're talking about Labor Day. And as so many of our friends and neighbors and fellow Americans are dealing with the uh, aftermath and the present challenge of Harvey, Hurricane Harvey, uh, it's a good idea to talk about what public employees, unionized public employees, are doing right on the ground right now to try to save lives. Together to talk about this and other topics is a friend of all of ours, uh, including uh, uh, our listening audience, and that is President Lee Saunders of Ask Me. Welcome to the show, Lee. Thanks for being here, man. Thanks for having me. What are your fo- what's going on? Folks who are on the ground helping people through uh, Harvey, could you talk a little bit about what public employees, unionized public employees uh, are doing? to well, help people through the, t- the trouble? First of all, obviously our hearts and prayers go out to those who have been affected in that, uh, in that hurricane, uh, not only in certain parts of Texas, but now in Louisiana. Um, we, uh, we have been helping and supporting our, our members who are public service workers in those areas, uh, have been providing essential public services all in those areas. Uh, whether it is uh, draining of pipes or watching out for the animals that have been affected in the shelters or providing health care services. Our members are there. Our members are providing those essential public services, essentially risking uh, uh, sometimes their lives and helping others. Uh, And I think it's also important to remember that our members live in those communities, so they have been negatively impacted by this hurricane. They don't know what their house looks like. They don't know what other family members have been affected because they have been on the job every single day providing services to the community. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, we, uh, uh, we send out our thoughts and our prayers and we also have got to acknowledge the volunteers and the public service workers and everyone who is trying to bring uh, that area back together. And that's what this country should, all, should be about. Uh, It shouldn't be divisive. Uh, We are bringing people back together and uh, doing the right thing and helping one another. Absolutely. And, you know, Lee, we've just been joined by our chair, Tom Perez. Come on over here, Tom. Good to see you, man. Can we get a chair up here for our chairman? You know, come on over here. How you doing, brother? Uh, My friend Lee Saunders and I, whenever I think of Lee, I think of uh, we did an event on October 7th. 2015 at the White House. It was a summit on worker voice because, you know, we believe that when we have strong labor unions in America, we have a strong middle class. And uh, the president was speaking and he uh, was talking about how, you know, the first time you say something, you have to get, the first time you say something that wasn't originally your idea, you have to attribute it to someone. Right, right. The second time you say, well, somebody learned once said, and then the third time you just take it for yourself. Just use it, just use it, yeah, yeah. And uh, he he stole a line that I have stolen regularly from Lee, which is, uh, you know, if we're not at the table, we're on the menu. But true, but true. uh, One of the reasons I've loved working with Lee is he's been working hard to make sure that we are at the table. Absolutely. uh, and we're going to continue to do that. And, and you and the know, president are going to hear from my attorney. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a copyright on that. <laughs> That's your problem, man. You should have copyrighted That's that. Right. Because every time I say that, people laugh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, you could have gotten a lot. You, know, you could have uh, monetized that, my I friend. I sure could have. Lee was just making the point that uh, members of Ask Me are right there on the ground uh, fighting for folks and uh, who are dealing with Harvey right now and how much how much they're personally dealing with the tragedy, but also uh, helping others. Helping others. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, it, it, this is cataclysmic. Uh, when, when the meteorologist I was watching the other day said that the, uh, the floodplain is basically the size of Lake Michigan, that, that's a stunning uh, visual image. And uh, uh, the, the, the beauty, though, is you know, the, the, in a tragedy like this, you see 
you, frankly, you see sometimes America at its worst because you see looters and people who take advantage of folks. But uh, they're far outweighed and outnumbered by you know folks like his uh, members of the the, the Green <laughs> AFSCME yeah. team, who are out there not just helping taking care of themselves, but in a time like this, they're out there taking care of their neighbor. And that's what the best of America is about. That's what this country is all about. Yeah. No, we can never forget that. Amen. And uh, uh, thanks for what you continue to do day in and day out. We've been fighting the good fight for a long time. And, uh, you know, the, the thing that angers me as much as anything about this president is that they've just, uh, they're taking it right at the labor movement. I mean, the, the, the most consequential thing that this president has done year one is they've stolen that Supreme Court seat. And I, there, I have no doubt in my mind that Justice Gorsuch is poised to be the fifth vote to make it very, very hard for public sector labor unions um, to organize. And I have no doubt that after that decision comes down that they're going to go after private sector no labor question. unions next. That's, that's next. Well, and Tom, you were the labor secretary, <laughs> so you had a front row yeah. seat to what government and labor together can do to help people. And now here we are looking at quite a different scenario. Lee, what does uh, Janice versus Ask Me mean uh, to American workers? It's actually an attack on not only public service workers' freedoms, but everyone's freedoms, where uh, we have a process in this country where we, can, we have a seat at the table, uh, where we can uh, have collective bargaining. We negotiate over wages. Negotiate over working conditions, benefits. Mm -hmm. And there is an attempt by uh, some people in this country, the powerful, very wealthy, mm -hmm. where they don't want us to have a seat at the table. They want more power and they want more wealth at the expense of working families. And what this case essentially does is it limits our ability to represent the members that we have. And it limits the freedoms that our members have, whether it's the freedom to negotiate, whether it's the freedom to uh, determine your wages and working conditions through negotiation, whether it's the freedom to have some time off to take to your, take your parents or your grandparents or your kids sure. to the doctor's office or attend the PTA meeting, um, to, to have a voice to have a voice that determines your economic well-being. Uh, it takes away those kinds of freedoms. And unfortunately, the Supreme Court will be hearing Janus versus AFSCME probably the beginning of next year with a decision in between April and June, no later than June of next year. And if, in fact, they rule the wrong way, then what that will do is make the entire country in the public sector not state by state by state, but the entire country overnight right to work in the public sector. And Tom is exactly right. Uh, if they are successful mm -hmm. in doing that, then it's just a matter of time before the private sector uh, is affected and this entire country will be right to work. Well, it's also, uh, you know, the, there's a phenomenon that uh, certain people call free riders, and I'm one of them who calls them that. And, you know, right now, one of the great services you do for your members, if, if you're uh, employed somewhere and there's an employment action, you're, you're representing them at the first instance. And uh, that's a service they get for the dues that they pay. Well, we and have an obligation uh, to not only represent members within the bargain unit, but non-members alike. Exactly. So what does that mean? That means that you don't have to be a part of the union. You aren't forced to be a member but because you receive the same level of benefits and the wage increases and you can be represented by the union in grievances if something happens to you that's bad on the job, we have the, uh, the legal responsibility, the legal responsibility to represent non-members and members alike. So what fair share will do is if they get away with fair, get away with fair share, uh, the non-member can say, I'm not going to pay a dime, but I can still receive those level of services. And that's not right. It's not fair share. That's it's unfair not burden. Fair. <laughs> it's an unfair burden. I mean, it's almost like you're taking a, a group of friends out to dinner, 
and you choose a restaurant, you're sitting down, you're having a good time, and then the bill comes. And then one individual in the group says, well, I really didn't like this restaurant, so I'm not going to pay a dime, even though their stomach is full. There's a correlation there, right? And everyone else pays and, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, we've got to We've got to talk about that. But it really is. It goes beyond the collection of, uh, of dues, the collection of agency uh, fees. But it is about the ability of workers to organize and to be represented and to have a seat at the table. That's what this fight is all about. You know, I wanted to uh, put this in front of the two you, you, two of you guys. It was Martin Luther King who said, in our glorious fight for civil rights, we must guard against being fooled by false slogans such as right to work. It is a law to rob our civil rights and our job rights. Its purpose is to destroy labor unions and the freedom of collective bargaining by which unions have improved wages and working conditions of everyone. So again, you know, as we as, you know, as we think about Labor Day, what is the connection between civil rights and labor rights? Well, there is a, a deep connection. There's a deep connection between labor rights and economic rights, civil rights, human rights. Mm -hmm. um, we have a rich history within my union, representing 1.6 million public service workers across the country. But we understand that connection every single day. And we've actually lived through that connection on many occasions, but one of the most important events that took place within our history was a strike in Memphis, Tennessee in 1968. Sure. Where 1,300 sanitation workers represented by local 1733 AFSME uh, decided they were sick and tired of being sick and tired. Right. And they went on strike in February of 1968. Uh, the culmination being that two sanitation workers were crushed in a sanitation truck because of faulty equipment. Equipment that the sanitation workers had constantly told the employer was faulty but it resulted in a loss of two lives. And the sanitation worker said that was it, that was enough. And I'm sure that everyone remembers uh, uh, the fact that those sanitation workers carried signs. And those signs said, I am a man. That's right. Uh, fighting not only for union recognition, but fighting for dignity and fighting for respect on the job and fighting to have a seat at the table. Dr. King was planning the Poor People's March, yep. and he was informed of this strike, and he understood the connection between economic rights and civil rights, labor rights, human rights, and he interrupted his planning, and he traveled to Memphis on numerous occasions to support the sanitation worker strike, and everyone knows the story. He ultimately gave his life uh, in support of that strike. Um, that's a part of our union's history, but it's a part of our country's history. Right. And we can never forget that moment. It'll be 50 years next year, 2018. So we've got to, I believe, commemorate the actions of the sanitation workers and their bravery. We've also got to uh, commemorate the, the death of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. But it just can't be a commemoration, and we're going to be doing a lot of things in Memphis on April 3rd and 4th when Dr. King was shot. But it's got to be a call to action. Right. It just can't be one, a one-day event and people go home and forget about what we're confronted with right now, the, what the whole country is confronted with, and how some folks are trying to take us back in time to God knows where, where we've got to move forward. So we want it to be a call to action. So we have partnered with the Church of God in Christ. Uh, the Church of God in Christ was very active uh, with the strike in 1968. As a matter of fact, Mason Temple, where Dr. King gave his mountaintop speech, uh, that is their church. Uh, they represent more than six million members across the country. And they are partnering with us because they understand the importance of, number one, honoring what happened there, but they also understand, and we understand, and that's why we're partnering with them, that we have got to come together like never before. And we have got to go back into our communities, 
civil rights community, the labor community, the faith-based community, connect arms once again, and organize and mobilize and educate like never before. So we're going to be planning a number of activities prior to April 4th, starting in the fall, where we're going to have town hall meetings, where we're going to organize our communities. We're going to have training programs to train organizers to go back into their communities, all in preparation for the events on April 3rd and April 4th. We will have um, a meeting on April 3rd at the church in Mason Temple with all speakers right. talking about what happened then, but what we must do now and in the future. And then we're going to have a big march uh, starting at the Union Hall, 1733, and marching back to Mason Temple on April 4th, but then continuing that effort through November 2018 to mobilize and re-energize our communities and our partners and our friends to, to make the statement that we've come a long way, but we still got a long way to go. We believe in that energizing and organizing, Amen. don't we, Tom? Amen, and you can take it to the bank that we will be there side by side. Because as we sit here approaching another Labor Day, Labor Day uh, comes a few short days after uh, the anniversary of the March on Washington. Mm -hmm. And the March on Washington, as you know, because the labor movement, you know, people like Baird, Rustin, and others uh, helped to re lead this, uh, was a march for jobs and a march for justice. It was sanitation workers and others saying, you know, just because I pick up trash doesn't mean you can treat me like garbage. Mm -hmm. And we, we have to understand uh, as a nation, as we approach this Labor Day, uh, the importance of the labor movement across America and, and, the, and the existential threats that are posed. I mean, there, there was a study that came out recently that uh, looked at labor union density in the 20th century, and it, and it showed that um, income inequality was at its lowest when labor union density was at its highest. Let me repeat that. Income inequality was at its lowest when labor union density was at its highest. And, and that's why recently we at the DNC, a number of us were, were working with the UAW down in Mississippi, trying to help organize the Nissan plant because that same conference that Lee was at back at the White House in 2015, uh, there was a guy named Robert who was there. He was, Robert, uh, Robert is a permatemp. A permatemp is an oxymoron, a permanent temporary employee. He has to work something like 60 hours a week as a temporary employee to make what the permanent employees make Incredible. at the Nissan plant. And he has to train some of those permanent employees, the indignity of, of that. And, and frankly, you, you, you look at the racial overlay of what's going on down there and everywhere else on the planet where Nissan has um, a presence, every other country, they uh, they have an organized use for us, but they can't do it in the United States, and and we've got to take this fight. We didn't win that battle, but as I said to you know, Dennis Williams and others, well, I'm going to keep swinging a bat because I I believe to my core that we have to work like heck to build the labor movement in this country in the public sector, in the private sector, and and tell that story because. Uh, again, you look at the economists who are studying the income inequality that we're confronting now, and, and, and roughly a third of the inequality we've seen over the last four years, the wage, 40 years, not four years, 40 years, the, the wage stagnation that we see is a function of declining labor union density. And, and by the way, the Republicans know that. Well, that's why they're that's doing why it. That's why they're doing it. <laughs> well, they you very take well. a fork to the labor movement and you give more power to folks who already have too much power. Yeah. You know, could, could you all talk a little bit about the union advantage when it comes to just all workers, but also women workers, workers of color? I mean, you do better if you're in a union. Talk There's a little no bit question. about The wages are higher, the benefits are better. I can speak personally. I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, a long time ago. But I remember my dad was a bus driver. Mm -hmm for the city of Cleveland. It was a good union job. My mom was a community activist. Uh, my dad was a steward for his union, ATU, Amalgamated Transit Union. Right. If you were an African-American in Cleveland, there were three 
major professions or jobs that you would hold that could move you into the middle class. And every one of those jobs were organized by unions. Right. It was CTS, which was the Cleveland mm -hmm. Transit System, right. bus drivers. It was the post office. Of course. Okay. Now the union. Or then it was the plants, the steel plants, the auto plants in Cleveland and the surrounding area. Those were good union jobs. And they were able to move people of color and African Americans specifically into the middle class because they had decent wages and they had decent benefits. And I remember my folks were always sitting down with me at the kitchen table and talking to me about the importance of a union, the importance of solidarity, the importance of treating your community with respect. And that was drilled in the psyche of my brother and me. Mm -hmm. And that's what I carry today. Uh, and I believe that. I believe that because I grew up with it. I saw it in action. I mean, uh, we weren't rich by any means. But our members aren't rich. But they're providing essential public services to the citizens of their communities across the country. And if, in fact, they play by the rules and work hard every single day, the idea was back then, and it still is, that you're going to do better mm -hmm. than your parents, mm -hmm. right? Well, unfortunately, that's not happening right now. You've got a lot of frustration. You've got a lot of anger because there is no economic equality in this country. You mentioned it earlier, Tom. I mean, but it's a proven fact that unions not only help union members, but they help non-union members. members. They sit because the it lifts for. that boat up. Mm -hmm. Lifts that boat up. And what what really is ironic is, and there was just there was a study done. It came out, the results came out this week, where folks were asked across the country, do you believe in the trade union movement? Do you think that uh, it is helpful in today's society? 61% said yes. 61% yeah. said yes because I think they understand that we stand in the way of those that have a lot of power and a lot of wealth trying to take more power and wealth from people who are playing by the rules every single day and working families across this country. And Give us the opportunity to organize, and we're an organizing union. Yep. Okay? But unfortunately, the playing field is not level. It is awfully, awfully difficult under the current laws to organize, especially, especially in the private sector. Uh, you had workers in Nissan. You mentioned that. They wanted desperately to have a union. But that company threw everything at them, including the kitchen sink threaten them, threaten their families. As a matter of fact, the National Labor Relations Board ruled against the company, saying that they were doing unlawful activities. Right. Unlawful activities, trying to keep workers from exercising their democratic right to vote on whether they wanted a union or not. Not mandating that there be a union, but to vote in the democratic process to determine whether those workers wanted a union or not. And so we've got to make some changes in this country. When I was the labor secretary, I wrote a letter to uh, the president of Nissan. I co-wrote a letter with the labor, the labor minister of France. People might ask who are listening, why did you do that? France uh, owns a portion of Nissan because Renault is uh, mm -hmm. a subsidiary of Nissan. And the question I asked was simple. Why is it that in the rest of your world, you have a unionized workforce, and you have shared prosperity in those unionized workforces, but you can't do it in the United States. Uh, why don't we get together and talk about it? Uh, they did not respond, unfortunately. And uh, even though I had the labor minister of France, now the former mi labor minister of France, working with us, but uh, we've got to build this movement together. And uh, you know, the Democratic Party, and, and Lee wears many hats. In addition to his head of AFSCME, he's also a member of the Democratic National Committee, and we're very um, appreciative of the leadership he's shown on that. And, and we have to demonstrate what our values are as a party. And, 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 and the Democratic Party firmly believes that when the labor movement succeeds, the middle class succeeds. Here, here, and, that's uh, absolutely right. We have to, th this is a huge part of the unfinished business. And, and we have to confront certain realities. One reality is that a lot of folks who are members of certain labor unions ended up voting for Donald Trump, and we've got to earn their votes back. I think we can. 
uh, because we've got to tell them clearly what we stand for. We've got to we've got to explain to them, you know, what George, Justice Gorsuch means to their bottom line, to their future. And uh, and and there have been a number of labor leaders, including but not limited to to Lee, who who are working together with us on that. And I've we've both done a lot of listening. And you have done a lot of listening with your own membership. There's no question. Um, to to get a handle on that, and and I'd, I'd be really curious, you know, what what advice do you have moving forward um, for us? Because I I want to make that case to to folks that uh, you may have voted for change, but you were looking for change that was going to improve your life. And when you lose access to health care, as the uh, ACA repeal would have done. That's not change that improves your lives. And we were able to beat that. And we were able to beat that. We were able to beat it because what did we do? We organized and mobilized and educated our our communities. We knocked on doors, had one-on-one communication, talked to folks in a very clear and concise fashion about the fact that 23 million people could lose health insurance. If you had some disabilities, maybe they may not be covered under the yeah. Republican plan. Well, like, like pre-existing condition, they were going to subject people to that so again. So we talked. Yeah. We talked with folks, and that's what we've got to do. I mean, I don't think that any of us can deny that there are people that are very frustrated and angry, working, working families across the country. I get it. I understand it because people believe that they're playing by the rules every single day, but they don't have an opportunity to – to help themselves or their families or their communities. I get that. What we've got to do is to reconnect. And we've got to have a message that connects with people. And I think it's a message of economic justice and economic fairness. And we can't be afraid to say the word labor union or to say the words labor unions and to talk about what labor unions have meant To to workers in this country and to America. And so many times, quite honestly, you don't hear that term. People kind of shy away from it. Why? I mean, labor unions have helped build this country. That's right. And to build a standard of living that workers can be proud of. And that system is under attack right now. And so we can't be shy about talking about the importance of labor unions and what we have done for union members and non-union members alike. But we've also got to fix this rigged system, and it is a rigged system. And we've got to make sure that people feel that they have an opportunity to achieve anything they want to achieve. I mean, that's what was instilled in me when I was growing up. Lee, if you do the right thing, and if you work hard and you play by the rules, you're going to have a better life. You're going to have a better life. And there's a lot of folks out there right now that, that don't believe that that's possible that they will not have a better life. Mm-hmm. And we've got to get back to basics. And you're right, Tom, I mean, we're, we're rethinking our own strategy within our union. We represent 1.6 million members uh, in the public service. But uh, we're getting back to basics. And you know, we use the iPhones and the iPads and Facebook and Twitter and all the new technology sure. that's available to us. Those are good things, you can't ignore that. You've got to use that. Mm-hmm. But nothing takes the place of one-on-one conversation, communication, looking somebody in the eye, talking with them, but just as important, listening to them and listening to what they have to say. So we've made a commitment in our union to have one million one-on-one conversations, knocking on doors, talking with folks, listening to what they've got to say. And we haven't gotten there yet, but we're at the 700,000 mark. That's pretty good. Uh, over a two-year period. That's pretty good. And I will tell you this, we will reach a million, and then mm-hmm. we're going to set another goal to reach the other one, uh, 600,000. What have you uh, learned in those uh, uh, What have you learned in those conversations so far? We've learned that um, uh, people understand the importance of collective action. People understand the importance of collective bargaining. People also want to be treated as individuals. Okay, uh, people want to be recognized for the work that they do, and the important work that they do in public service. I mean, we represent every occupation that you can think of in the public mm-hmm. service, from doctors to sanitation workers 
Department of Transportation. Prosecutors librarians. and public defenders. That's right. We got them. Okay? I know that. I, know I mean, that. and people want to be recognized for the work that they do. They are not in these jobs mm -hmm. to make a whole lot of money. They aren't going to become millionaires. Well, if they are, they haven't done a very good job of that. <laughs> they aren't going to become millionaires. <laughs> but the non-monetary rewards. But you know what? <laughs> they care. Yep. Yeah. They care. And we, we call our members everyday heroes. Good name. Everyday mm -hmm. heroes who never quit. They never quit on their union. They never quit on their jobs. They never quit on their communities. And that connection has got to be talked about. And the best way to talk about it is to make the connection one-on-one -on -one so folks understand that you care about them, they care about the union, and let's talk together about what direction we need to move. You know, Lee, we are right there with you. We have an intensive engagement program we've been doing all summer. We're moving it right into the fall. We're taking a page from your playbook, organizing, knocking on the door, if, if you know, with the efforts you guys are putting forward and the effort uh, of the Democratic Party reconnecting at the grassroots, I believe better days are coming uh, because we're getting many more people excited about democracy, about their government, and about what we can do if we, we stick together. And if we do that, mm -hmm. we can win. Yep. We can, and I like the I mean, sounds of that. I mean, is the example. Sure. So, hey, um, we got some folks uh, who want to get in on the conversation. Heather, who you got for us? Uh, we do. This first question comes from Caleb on Facebook, who said, what are you doing to encourage those of us Democrats that haven't seen our state turn blue in some time? What steps would you encourage in a not-so-liberal South to best help us get elected? I'm sorry, and I missed the last part of the, uh, of the question. Sure. What, what steps would you encourage in a not-so-liberal South to best help us get elected? There's a story to be told in the South, right? There is a story. I mean, uh, there are some opportunities in the South. I don't know where the... Uh, where the caller is coming from, but there is an opportunity for us to, to, to come together, uh, do the same kinds of things that we're doing in the North and in the West and in the Southwest. I mean, it's not rocket science. It's about communicating, it's about talking with folks, and it's about developing community and developing a strategy that people can connect to. Uh, and it's about knocking on those doors and educating folks and mobilizing folks. You do that all over the country. We are having great success in the state of Florida, for example, as far mm -hmm. as organizing new workers. We're having great success in the Southwest as far as organizing new workers. Uh, and we've been able to beat back some real bad pieces of legislation because of our ability to organize not only our members but our communities. Um, and we've just got to continue to do that. We've got to, we've got to raise the stakes. Well, I mean, well. we've got to raise the stakes. and, and uh, uh, you know, this this is not easy. It's hard. Organizing is hard. Yep. It's a real it job. It really is. <laughs> and I distinguish organizing from mobilizing. Mobilizing is that eight-week sprint. And, uh, you know, we've done that often, and, and those are really important. We did a pretty good mobilization around the Affordable Care Act. But we have to not only mobilize, we've got to organize. That's a 12-month-a-year enterprise. And when you're out there doing that, talking to people, when you take the word off-year – out of the electoral lexicon. Every year is an on year because yep. every year it's you true. should be talking to people. And, and, and as for her question, which was a great question, there are a number of examples of when we're out there talking to people, putting our values in action, we can win. There were two special elections in Oklahoma a couple months ago uh, in districts where Donald Trump won overwhelmingly. And in these state legislative races, Democrats won both seats because they were out there talking to people. They were leading with their values. I spoke to both candidates. The big issue out there was education, and they spoke about it, and they spoke with pride and, and, and with clarity, and we won those elections. In Iowa, just a few weeks ago, there was a, a special election in a district that, again, Donald Trump won a, house, a state house race. Donald Trump won that district handily. And um, a veterinarian, Dr. Miller, uh, won that race because he led with his values. So we can do this. And even in Georgia, where we almost won Georgia 6, um, the, the beauty of that is we, we, we've, been, we've now been talking to people in Georgia 6, in many cases, for the first time in years. And, and, and we can win statewide in Georgia if we're organizing 12 months a year. So that's what we got to do. That's exactly, you know, Keith's leadership in our... Uh, resistance summer effort was exactly 
that down payment of the new DNC. You said that you're talking to your members, one million strong, and then you're gonna get to the other 600,000. And that's exactly what this summer was about. And now we've mo we were just folding it right into rise and mobilize in the that's fall. Right. And, and right. it's all about getting out there because I believe firmly that our message of opportunity, our message that when labor unions succeed, America succeeds, and our message of health care as a right for all and not a privilege for a few and and you know access to jobs that pay a middle class wage, that resonates with people. They want to hear that and 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 when we're out there, and frankly, we weren't out there. We, we have an every zip code strategy now. That's right. And, and we had seeded whole cloth certain geographic parts of the country. That ain't happening anymore. We're, That's right. The new Democratic National Committee is, is, is playing in every zip code. Every you zip know, code. I, I really and truly believe that people have to believe in their guts that they can make a difference. And right now, you have folks who don't believe they can make a difference for a variety of reasons. And we've got to reinstill that faith mm -hmm. in them. And the only way that you do that, I believe, is number one, to have a message and a program and a strategy. But they have to believe that there is that message that can possibly be won if it comes through collective action, if it comes through organizing our communities right. across the country. Because there is a lot of frustration. A lot of frustration out there because people don't believe that they have control over their lives and that they can't make a difference. They can make a difference. We, we have shown that uh, in a variety of different kinds of ways, but it's keeping people together so they understand that if we do this, if we do this, there's a good ch chance that we can win. That's right. Now, we can't guarantee victory all the time, mm -hmm. but you know what? If you're engaged in the battle and you're engaged in that fight, and you're mobilizing and organizing those communities and educating, then there's a real good chance that we can win. You're going to win some. And even if we lose, we're going to keep that coalition together That's so we right. can keep on battling. And let me just tell you, I was down talking to a chapter of the United Food and Commercial Workers in Birmingham, Alabama. We don't want anybody to think that you can't unionize the South. In fact, that may be right territory because people down there have some of the lowest wages so we want we want to be fighting in the south just like the questioner asked heather we got another question up we do i think we have time for one more question um this one is a little bit different but still very important it comes from jackie here in dc who said how can we continue to push back on trump's election commission yeah that fake thing <laughs> what do you what do you think what's your take on that lee i i think that we're doing what we need to do we're we're uh, we're going back to basics, mm -hmm. uh, something that uh, we kind of forgot about, to be quite honest with you. And we're going back and we're talking with pe people and we're trying to develop, and, uh, and I believe the message should be around economic fairness where uh, folks have a chance to succeed. I think that um, uh, people are very tired of the divisiveness uh, that is existing right now, and people are actually frightened mm -hmm. about what's happening. But we can't run on a negative campaign. I think we've got to run on a vision. Sure. On a vision that um, builds up working families, uh, that supports everyone who's trying to play by the rules every single day. Uh, and we've got to have a positive message that people can attach themselves to, to believe that we can win this. Uh, you know, we've got so many negatives going on right now, we can't dwell on the negatives. We've got to highlight them and talk about the bad things that are happening, but we've got to have a positive message, a positive message of, of, uh, of what can be, how we can benefit our communities across the country. And when we develop that positive message, I think that we can win all over the place. I agree. Tom, you want to yeah, mention anything about this sure. Chris Kobach commission? Yeah. yeah. We, I really appreciate that question because uh, one of the things I, I've talked about our work as uh, we have an infrastructure. That this is what we're doing. We're building infrastructure. We've spoken a lot today uh, about organizing infrastructure. We're, we're building a technology infrastructure that's second to none. We're building... Uh, uh, a young uh, millennial engagement infrastructure, and we're building a voter protection and expansion infrastructure uh, because it, it, again, we tend to mobilize, but we don't build the infrastructure. It, it can't be eight weeks before the presidential that we do this. We have to understand that the, um, 
the, the playbook of the Republican Party is about voter suppression. It's always been about voter suppression. I'm going to see if I can play a 40-second clip. I'm going to put this on here. And I don't know if it's going to go on. Oh, yeah, Paul Weyrich. Good government. They want everybody to vote. I don't want everybody to vote. Elections are not won by a majority of people. They never have been from the beginning of our country, and they are not now. As a matter of fact, our leverage in the elections quite candidly goes up as the voting populace goes down. Yeah, that's Paul uh, Weyrich. That's my yeah. case. This is Paul yeah. Weyrich. And mm -hmm. uh, he was the, one of the founders of ALEC. Yep. This was not a speech given in 2015. This was a speech given in 1980. We as Democrats have to understand, and I, I got to live this firsthand when I mm -hmm. ran the Civil Rights Division. Voter suppression is part of the playbook. They want less people to vote, especially people of color, mm -hmm. uh, because that's how they win elections. Greg Abbott won in Texas. 33% of the folks voted. We've got to get more out. They've passed a voter ID law to make it harder for folks to get out. And, and he's uh, speaking again. He, there he Here goes. He is. He's speaking Shut again. Shut that guy up. Uh, and I bring that up, and I carry that with me on my smartphone to remind myself and to remind people when we're talking about this issue about how ingrained voter suppression is in the Republican playbook. And that's why I'm so excited about the work we're doing here. And we're doing work in partnership with Eric Holder. There's a, an election commission that the president set up, and, and a number of folks are working on that. And they have we're a critically important role. And you've been a contributor and a, a major player. What the DNC adds is we have 50 state parties and parties in the territories. And we have to build that infrastructure in all the states. Because I've learned firsthand that sometimes we win the battle and we lose the war. We file that uh, voter purge case in North Carolina in 2016, and we get a good decision from the court, but we got it six days before the election. We won the battle, but we couldn't find the voters. And when you have the 50 state infrastructure of voter protection in place, when you're building relationships now in 2017 with that elections commission in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, uh, or wherever you need to build it. That's how you prevent problems from occurring. And, and that's what we're doing as a Democratic Party. And, and this commission that the President uh, Trump uh, put together, it has nothing to do with integrity. Mm -hmm. It has everything to do with his continual obsession with the fact that Hillary Clinton won three million more votes than he did. And it's part of their propaganda machine. And 40% uh, of, of people who voted for Donald Trump believe that he won more votes than Hillary Clinton because he keeps saying it. It's just like his birther stuff with President uh, Obama. And so we've got to be relentless on this. And we've got to understand that they have no morality on this issue of voting. They just want to do anything, scorched earth, to make it harder for people to vote. What a cruel irony. You know, as we celebrate recently the, the anniversary of the passage of the Voting Rights Act, and, and Democrats could not disagree more with what I just played. And, and that's why the new Democratic National Committee is all about fighting in every 50 state to make sure we expand the right to vote, whether right. it's universal voter registration when you turn 18, whether it's expanded early voting, whether it's making sure that... Uh, you know, we, we do away with all these um, uh, voter ID laws that are nothing about voter integrity and everything about voter suppression. And, and also about, uh, we believe in second chance. We think that people ought to be able to vote even after they've been in trouble. They should be able to participate in democracy again. Amen. So, so you know, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. President, I think we've reached about the end of our time. But any final comments, uh, you know, as we are uh, recognizing the dignity of labor, the right of workers to come together and, and argue and negotiate together for better workers, better pay. Uh, anything you guys want to close us out with right now? Well, I would just say that uh, uh, our freedoms are under attack. And whether it's voting rights or labor rights, I mean, they have a huge playbook. It's just not a one-issue playbook. <laughs> it is a huge playbook, and that is to, uh, to give themselves more power and wealth 
at the expense of us and the expense of working families. Um, we can't let we can't let that happen. And in order to win, we've got to have a, a message that attracts uh, and where people believe that people believe in to re-engage them in this process and to re-engage in the battle. And the other thing that I would say is that uh, if you have a weak labor movement or a non-existent labor movement in this country, and that's what they would like to see because they are attacking it every single day. I mean, there was a, a letter that was published this week where they specifically talked about attacking public service unions. And if you attack public service unions and dismantle them, then that destroys, that destroys working families and it destroys the Democratic Party. That's they said right. that publicly, yep. Yep. okay? So we've got to fight against that. Uh, and the only way you do that is through organizing and that one-on-one -on -one, uh, communication uh, and having a message and then bringing people in uh, to fight that good fight every every single day and to make their voices heard. That's why Labor Day is so important. Yep. I mean, it's, um, uh, you know, folks are out, I know, today and they're, they're cooking the steaks and, you know, having a couple of beers and having a good time. Uh, that's a good thing, nothing wrong with that, but we've also got to rededicate ourselves to what Labor Day really stands for. And Labor Day stands for the recognition of work, the recognition how working families have built this country to where it is today. Uh, and uh, that we can't lose sight of that. And we've got to understand our history before we start moving forward. And that's what Labor Day is all about. It's reconnecting, it's fighting for working families. It's believing in the labor movement and what the labor movement has been able to do in this country to promote the welfare and the economic stability of working families. And we've got to continue to engage in that battle. Lee Saunders of ASME and the American Labor Movement, everybody. Tom, Chairman, Tom, you want to close us up? One of my favorite Labor Days was Labor Day 2014. I had the privilege of being the Labor Secretary, and I had the privilege of traveling with President Obama to a Labor Day event. And uh, I had the privilege, uh, and the President had the privilege of being joined on that trip by three distinguished labor leaders, uh, a woman named Mary Kay Henry yep. of SEIU, a gentleman named Leo Girard, the head of the steel, steel workers. workers, and a gentleman named Lee Saunders. And... Uh, I remember sitting on the plane with the president and talking about how do we, we were talking about, uh, it was a case called Friedrichs, the, 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 the precursor to what Lee talked Janus about versus uh, Aspen, yeah. a, a few minutes back. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, was rem it was so important and, and heartening to have a president who understood the importance of the labor movement. And, uh, and, and this is what ele elections have consequences. And the reason we are all working so hard to build this Democratic Party and to make sure we build it consistent with our values is so that we can win elections and elect good Democrats. Because you know what? When Democrats win, I firmly believe that, as my friend Keith Ellison has said many times, <coughs> good things happen to good people. That's right. <laughs> and uh, I don't think we've got labor leaders traveling on Air Force One uh, with this president. <laughs> Not now, uh, we, We've got other folks traveling with him to figure out how to undo the labor movement. So we have our work cut out <coughs> for us, and every day needs to be Labor Day uh, in America, a day in which we honor the dignity of work. And the best way to honor it is to pay people a fair wage, to make sure they can retire with dignity, to make sure they can build a good life for their family. So, um, Lee, thank you. And I want you, I I'd like to thank your parents, too, because clearly the acorn didn't fall far from the tree <laughs> at the uh, Saunders residence. And um, we appreciate uh, at the Democratic Party your unwavering um, advocacy on behalf of working people across this country. Well, thanks for me ha having me on the show. Well, let me tell you, this has been another edition of Democrats Live, special Labor Day uh, edition. Please know that we are fighting for and believe in the families, the victims of Harvey Ask me and all public employees are out there fighting it. Harvey will be with you. Stay tuned for another edition of Democrats Live. We'll see you next time. Thank you very much.